big word. When I think of the Democrats, that uh, no wonder that uh, I think they are vermin. But there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. At the end of the world, the Democrat, there is a rat there. And that's vermin. And the, uh, today we have a, uh, politics is a Greek word, as I said, meaning poly means many, and ticks are blood sucking insects <laughs> that make our lives miserable. Huh? But the Christianization began in, in, in a large way with Martin Luther, the famous arch heretic that fragmented Christianity into a multitude of sects. Even today in the United States of America, we have 45,000 denominations. I can imagine some Jesus saying to St. Peter, you are rock upon this rock, I'll build my 45,000 churches. <laughs> Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Huh? But the sacred heart of Jesus appeared to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque in the 1600s, over a, a century after Martin Luther, in order to give to France, being the uh, firstborn child of the church, the opportunity to bring back Christendom. And he asked St. Margaret Alacoque to tell the king the political power to do four things. One, he should display the uh, sacred heart in the standards of France. Two, he should build a chapel dedicated to the sacred heart of Jesus in Versailles. Three, he should uh, consecrate himself, his crown, his family to the sacred heart of Jesus. And four, that's the most important one, the king should ask the pope to approve a mass of the sacred heart, which didn't exist in those days. He wanted the political power to act on behalf of the sacred heart, of, to re-Christianize Europe. Well, needless to say that uh, Louis XIV did not do it. Well, 100 years later, exactly, his descendant, Louis XVI, was going to the guillotine, was in prison. And uh, I was in France and I read his testament when he vowed, he promised the sacred heart of Jesus, he would do everything he had requested. He would consecrate himself, the country, everything to the sacred heart of Jesus. But it was too late. From there, he left for the guillotine. Interesting enough, there is only one example in sacred scripture when God our Lord performed a cosmic miracle. Joshua was fighting the Amorites and he was winning the battle but the day was coming to the end and he said, Lord, stop the sun in the sky. And God heard the voice of a man and he stopped the sun in the sky so that uh, Joshua and his 40,000 men could win the battle against the Amorites. Mira, a cosmic miracle. It's amazing. How does it work? I have no idea. That's the only time it happens? No, it's not. A second time it happens. A cosmic miracle. The sun, the sun danced in the sky in Fatima, Portugal. A cosmic miracle. For about 10 minutes, it moved in the, in the sky. And people thought it was the end of the world in the face of 70,000 people. Now, to have a cosmic miracle, must, she must have had a very important message. What did she say? Pray the rosary? Yes. But it's a lot more than that. He, she had a social political message, which has been, by and large, ignored in the Catholic Church when she said Russia will spread her errors throughout the world. Russia specifically, which in those days were not, not even a communist country. Today we have a socialism in every single university of the world, including Catholic universities. Russia spread the errors through, de-Christianized the world. Russia was the first country to approve abortion. We have an abortion everywhere. Russia did spread the and our lady gave the opportunity to prevent that, to amend our lives. Unfortunately, the preaching of the church was not sufficient. 
And she asks for two things. One, God wants to have devotion to my immaculate heart established in the world. To this day, this devotion is not official. We have the, uh, the, the divine mercy. We just had the prayer. It's official. We have this one certain day of the year when we have the immaculate heart of Mary, not official. Sacred heart of Jesus, not official. To this day, the church has not made it official devotion. It's facultative. We can do, some people do, some people don't. It doesn't matter. Second thing she asks, consecrate Russia to my immaculate heart. And every single pope thought he knew better. Let's consecrate the whole world. Let's consecrate this without the bishops. Or this, until came Pope Francis, who consecrated Russia, but he also added Ukraine. Okay, why don't you guys do what Our Lady asked? What's the word Russia is missing? Actually, if you read the memoirs of Sister Lucia, I have read. They are originally in Portuguese, but there are also translations. And uh, our Lord appeared to her, and he said, Ask the Holy Father to consecrate Russia to my mother's immaculate heart. Lucia replied, I'm giving word, word by word, but Lord, the Holy Father will not do it. And Jesus said, Pray for the Holy Father. He will do it, but it will be late. Like the king of France, it will be late. He compared Louis XIV's failure to obey the will of God with the popes of our time. Do what they say. Now, from the historical perspective, we have, to, we have a big reality to face. The word dechristianization, which has taken over the whole planet Earth. Pope Pius XI used this word in two papal encyclicals, Divini Redemptoris, when he condemned the errors of communism, and Firmissima Constancia, when he defended the rights of the Mexicans in their fight against a Masonic per communist government. But it was Pius XII who defined very well the dechristianization. In an allocution he made it to the, Catholic, to the men of the Catholic action in Italy. In 1953, he said this, the danger that uh, hovers over mankind is an economy without God, politics without God, and laws without God. This is very, I don't know any person who ever heard of this declaration. An economy, politics, and law without God. There's no time here to go into the three aspects. I'll take just one, the laws without God, is when the uh, parliaments and the Congress and Senates, they decide what is good and what is evil. If uh, yesterday homosexuality was, was wrong, they have a new vote and make it legal, then it begins good, it starts to be good. There, there is to say, they play God. This is a very dangerous thing. Because if there is a, there is a, a composer, a writer in Russia called Dostoyevsky, he had this sentence. If God does not exist, everything is allowed. Let it sink in. If God does not exist, everything is allowed. In Russia, his country, the communist government did just that. That there's no God, they did what they pleased. They had concentration camps, camps and the assassination of thousands of the people in slavery and everything else. Because there is no God, there's no superior authority who can do what we like. Likewise, here in the United States, in Canada, in France, Congress, Senate, Parliament, they play God. So uh, when it happens, that in the church, inside the Holy Mother Church, we have the same attitude. When uh, bishops play God, instead of serving God, they play God. When you see cardinals here in America, 
favoring the uh, LGBTQ, whatever else. Are they homosexual themselves? I don't doubt. I don't doubt. You take the famous uh, vedette of uh, homosexuality here, James Martin, S.J. You know what S.J. used to mean society of Jesus? Today it means Sodomite of Judas. <laughs> the response of the church had to be evangelization, to counteract this action of the devil and their minions, and his minions. Evangelization, our Lord gave a specific mission to the church, go and preach the gospel to every person, baptize them, teaching them to observe everything whatsoever I have commanded you. Today we have uh, one bishop going to defend the faith, and he's the object of persecution. Um, he's, Jesus never said, go and ecumenize. He said, go and evangelize. To evangelize is to preach the gospel, the evangel, and try to persuade people to become Christian. That's what St. Francis Xavier, all these missionaries did. But today we do dialogue instead. I, have, I remember when I, His Holiness, the, not the Vicar of Christ, but Pope Francis said that um, proselytism is, uh, is a sin, it's against ecumenism. Um, okay, let's take a parallel example. I lived in Australia for a while, and there was a, a number of uh, Protestant denominations there. They tried to come together to make a one, uh, one single denomination, at least to be parallel to the Catholic Church. But the problem was there were some uh, doctrinal contradictions among them. So, for example, the Presbyterians believed in, the, uh, in predestination. The Methodists didn't. So they removed predestination from their creed. The uh, Baptists don't accept the infant baptism, but the Lutherans do. So they removed the Baptists. So at the end of the day, when they removed everything, what do you have? Um, actually, uh, what do you have from a marriage between a Jehovah Witness and a member of this church? It's somebody who knocks at your door for no apparent reason. <laughs> the uh, contraception revolution was the beginning of the uh, spread of the errors of Russia inside the Holy Mother Church. When Paul VI wrote his encyclical letter about contraception and uh, Humane Vitae, and the whole bishops' conference in Canada had a meeting in Winnipeg one year later, and you can find this on the internet, and they affirmed they would not promote that teaching, that would impose restrictions on the people. So it was a, a schismatic act. The church in Canada is schismatic. They refused their obedience to a moral teaching of the Pope. Who knows about that? Who cares? Well, that's all right. You can do whatever you like. If there is no God, everything is allowed. But the, uh, the effect of a contraception among Catholics has been also very noticeable. You take, for example, leaving aside all the moral side of it, um, for a population of a country to remain exactly the same, every woman or every couple should have 2.1 children. It's not to have two kids and a piece of another one. It's not this. <laughs> it's a statistic thing. Say, for example, 10, 10 couples, 10 women. Nine have two children, and one has three. If you do that, the population remains the same, does not grow, does not diminish. Today in Europe, the cradle of Christendom, of Christian civilization, from, from whom we got the faith, not one single country has two children per couple, per woman, not one. Which means that every year, over one million Europeans disappear. 
Europe is gradually dying out. Too many old people, too few young people, too few children. I was in, in, in London some years ago in a Catholic conference, and I heard this story of a dialogue between uh, a mullah from the local mosque, Muslim, and the, uh, a, a priest from the uh, Church of England. And the mullah said to him, do you know, by the end of this century, all the great English cathedrals will be our mosques. Do you know why? Because we have children and you don't. I spent some time in France working at school, and I heard this uh, motto of the French Muslims when they said, Par le ventre de nos femmes, nous allons conquérir l'Europe. By the wombs of our women, we shall conquer Europe. And they will. America will be the next and then they go. It may take a hundred years, but the jewel of the Christian civilization, the pride that we have of being a Christian nation, will gradually enter into a twilight. Um, WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's a question that comes naturally. You have to have a response to this. Some people say, well, at best you say, go and see no more. But also within the realm of possibilities, there are several options. We must also never forget that uh, you could grab a whip and beat the daylights out of the jerks in the temple. That's what he did. Meek and humble of heart, when the glory of God was insulted, and the temple became a den of thieves. Today is that we are a den of sodomites. Beat them up. When he said, don't think I came to bring peace on earth. I came to bring the sword. He, when he went to the uh, Gethsemane, he said to the apostles, in Luke 22. He who does not have a sword, let him sell his mantle and buy one. That's the time when St. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians chapter 6, when he describes the armor of the Christian, the helmet of salvation, the, the shield of, of faith, the sword of the word of God, the breastplate of justice. That's what we are called to be involved in this. St. Uh, Ignatius of Loyola had this um, meditation in his uh, spirituality. Agire contra, to act against, to stand up and oppose the evil that happens in us, within us. When we are tempted, we must act against that inclination. That's how we form a temper, a personality with God's grace. You know that um, here in the United States, 70% of the Catholics no longer believe in the real presence. Um, it means that uh, because of lack of teaching, we see the, receiving the Holy Eucharist as a liturgical act. You know, you stand up for the gospel, you kneel for the consecration, you sit for the homily, and you go and receive the communion. It's part of the liturgy. Then that's all. There's no, nothing special about the... Jesus being present, whatever. Actually, funnily enough, uh, I see Jesse Romero think of that. In many churches in America, there are lots of Latinos. And when communion time comes, many Latinos don't go for communion. That's okay. That's fine. You don't feel ready to do it, don't do it. But among us gringos, everybody goes. Everybody goes to communion. So we... I do, we are getting a very virtuous crowd in the, or the concept of the Holy Eucharist has been diluted. The, the Bishop's Conference of the U.S. of A. started a Eucharistic revival. We had that last week in the, my diocese of Winona. And Bishop Robert Barron, we all known to all, was there. And they had four and a half thousand people. 
And uh, I went there. I said, boy, that's finally something great is happening now. Revival, the faith in the real presence. We had four speakers, the bishop and three lay folks. All the lay folks did was to tell about their own personal experience. Sorry, we don't give a hoot about your opinions. We want to have a, the, I want to know what the church teaches. The bishop gave a reasonable uh, explanation. And this, um, he gave a, a com made a comment on, on, on St. John chapter 6. But I was so disappointed. We need to have a fervor. Fervor. Not just a, a little comment. In. When we think that um, our Lord Jesus Christ said clearly, if any of you scandalize one of those little ones who believe in me, it would be better that a millstone be tied to your neck and cast at the end of the bottom of the sea. Jesus Christ himself defended capital punishment by drowning for those who scandalize the children. When you see today the abuse of the children, the transgenders, the, everything else happening here, that's the ones who deserve death penalty if we had a decent government. <laughs> when uh, Bozo Biden comes up and says that the children, your children, uh, all our children, say, that's what Mao Zedong said. Your children don't belong to you, belong to the state. So we, we, you we are facing a major, a major crisis. The destruction of innocence, innocent children. Actually, a, a good sign, I find, is the um, of divine providence assistance to the American people is the boycott against Target Bud Light, the Dodgers, and everything else. That's good. It's a natural thing. Coming out of the people, there's no leadership. There's no, thank God, there, are no, there is no bishop's conference the, the decree on that. The people comes out, and the bishop joins the laity. That's the beauty of it. Bishop Strickland. Bottom line for us, my friends, is not a pleasant reality. When we are called to resist the ecclesiastical authority. Resist. St. Paul gives us the biblical example in the epistle to the Galatians. When St. Peter was, become, was being uh, politically correct in uh, Antioch and uh, ignored the Gentile Christians because the Judaizers from Jerusalem were coming. And St. Paul resisted him to his face, mean publicly. And St. Peter, the first pope, he knew implicitly at least where he was in follow, where he was not. And he accepted the correction of St. Paul. So humility is to accept the correction when we are wrong. And the many, many times in my articles, in my talks, I raise this question. If I say anything wrong, tell me what it is. Don't tell me your opinion. Opinion is like a nose. Everybody has got one. No, <laughs> not interested in this. And again, I'm glad to see that what is said here at this conference is the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank God. And we can be tranquil and fight this combat to the best of our ability. Um, the Cristeros in Mexico had a very uh, beautiful story. Uh, Jesse Romero mentioned the, uh, the movie uh, For Greater Glory. And the, uh, and the, the Cristeros had this, um, this uh, fight. And uh, they used to shout, Viva Cristo Rey. It has been improperly translated into English. Viva is not long live Christ the King. 
because that, that means that Christ the King will have a long life and then he dies. No, no, it's not this. Viva, in Latin language, is more like, it's difficult to translate, but it's more like um, um, praise be. Praise be Christ the King. And the uh, reply is, que viva, let him be praised. So uh, in our days, we can adopt the motto of the Christeros, who laid down their lives for our Holy Mother Church. The, by the way, you know how the, the communists have this salute, the, the, the cleansed fist? The Nazis make a hand like this. The Muslims make one finger, meaning the, uh, the, uh, there's only one God. The Satanists make two fingers like this. And I thought, what's the Catholic sign? Until I saw, no, 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 with the hand, with the hand. It was a Catholic sign. And I saw that the, uh, when the Swiss God swear allegiance to the papacy, they make a gesture like this. The three persons of the Trinity and the two natures in Christ. So uh, when I was in Colombia, everybody was saying like this, oh, hello, how are you? How this? <laughs> affirming their Catholic faith. And uh, finally, when the, uh, the priests praise the uh, first chapter of St. John in the Gospel, at the end of Mass, some men were doing like this. And I asked, why? I said, because uh, the Roman soldier saluted their superior like this. The crusaders saluted their superior like this. The Bosquetiers in France saluted their king like this. So the, at, as the uh, gospel is being said, all the, only the men were called to be knights, were called to fight. That's the idea that, that St. Uh, Paul explains in the, in the epistle. Wives, be submissive to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. So when the men are called to sacrifice themselves, that is our mission as men. Viva Cristo Rey! Que viva!